When you think of FPGAs, what comes to mind? Lots of configurable logic blocks? Great for data centers and networking? Sure, all of that is still true. But nowadays, field programmable gate arrays are finding their way into more and more consumer applications, IoT and smart home designs, and yes, are making great strides in industrial and networking applications. But not just any FPGAs. We're talking about low-density FPGAs from Renaissance. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Matthew Leonard from Renaissance and I explore the benefits that forge FPGAs. Low-density FPGA solutions from Renaissance bring to a variety of applications, including computing and storage, wearables, consumer electronics, and more. We also investigate the LUT structure of these low-density FPGAs, how these solutions can be utilized for drone sensor aggregation, and how Renaissance is breaking barriers of entry for FPGA solutions with their Forge FPGAs. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Renaissance. Hi, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. It's good to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about Forge FPGA today, the low-density FPGA solutions from Renaissance. But Matt, before we dig into the details, tell me why we're seeing a move toward FPGA technology these days. Yeah, I mean, FPGA in general makes a lot of sense for a very large range of customer applications as designs increase in complexity over time, right? So the general trend in the design of a product is for its complexity, whether it be, you know, internal, external, to increase over time. And in things like IoT and notebooks, you could have something along the lines of firmware revisions that affect hardware beyond the central MPU or MCU that is being used. For networking, when complexity increases with networking, either larger data buffers could be needed or inherently parallelized processing that is much more suited for multiple data lines than something like a dedicated MCU, which has to kind of pump through that data sequentially. And AV and sensor processing is kind of the key application in which the increase in complexity is most noticeable, increasing number of sensors, right? So for any given IoT device, any given consumer electronics device that has sensors on it, these days there are many more sensors than there used to be. And so to avoid things like a total redesign of a system, something to mitigate all of that extra data flying around for the MCU to handle is sorely needed. And a low-density FPGA specifically is a really, really great solution for exactly that. That makes sense. Now, Matt, what kind of markets would Forge FPGA be a good fit for? Forge FPGA is a very truly mass market device. You can use these things just about, just about anywhere. They have the capabilities for doing such, and they certainly have the price point for doing such. So things like computing and storage, wearable devices. We're seeing a lot of interest in wearable devices for our smallest Forge FPGA, which has a really great wafer level CSP package size. Networking, like I said previously, always benefits from inherently parallel processing devices. So FPGA, CPLDs have always been a key contributor to networking infrastructure. Smart home and IoT also are very key applications for Forge FPGA. They've been relatively inaccessible for FPGAs in the past due to some of the barriers of entry for FPGAs as a whole, being you know power consumption, cost, things like that. And that also very much ties into consumer electronics, where things like battery-powered applications, FPGAs need to have a a low sleep current to really make sense in those applications, and Forge FPGA has the lowest. And industrial as well, supervisory circuits, watchdog circuits, and instantaneous kind of parallelized cutoff sensing is very much required in industrial applications. And FPGAs and CPLDs have been a staple there for quite a long time. So pretty much everywhere but in a, you know, a baseball bat, I guess, I guess would be a good fit for Forge. So let's get into some details. What all can I do with Forge FPGA? Good applications that we've seen over the kind of the course of the development of our initial Forge FPGA devices have been very wide ranging. There are customers using Forge FPGA for 
applications we didn't even foresee when we spec the device in the first place, things like display driving of small wearable displays and things like that. But the key use cases that we designed Forge with Forge in mind are things like complex power sequencing. Protocol conversion has been a very big point of interest for many, many customers. You know, if you need to quickly convert protocols, whether, you know, unidirectionally, bidirectionally, protocol conversion is a very popular use case for small FPGAs. Data aggregation and pipelining, I think we're going to talk about that in some of the slides coming up, so I won't get too far into it. Sensor interfacing, very much the same thing. Advanced supervisory and error correction circuits. With something like an FPGA that's an inherently parallel device, the response times for supervisory circuits or error correction circuits can be much faster because there's no requirement for the data to be handled sequentially. And so they make a lot of sense in things like industrial supervisory circuits. Low power data buffering, just building up another intermediary between the outside world and the central MCU so you can extend its useful lifespan. Many customers try to avoid when specking up or increasing the capabilities of a device is having to do an entire internal redesign. And so a lot of these speak very directly to that need to extend the useful life of a given central MCU or MPU solution. Large-scale glue logic, sweeping up as many discretes that exist on a board as possible with things like Forge FPGA, you can really take a lot of discrete logic devices and sweep them up into one FPGA, saving yourself board space, saving yourself bill of material cost, and saving yourself power consumption very often as well. Basic edge processing, so if you have a small algorithm that fits within a low-density FPGA that you'd like to implement for one of your sensors, or maybe you want to build a custom interface for a sensor, a low-density FPGA works very well for that. It certainly has the capabilities and certainly has the required power consumption and speed specs that would be necessary for that kind of thing. And asynchronous state machines, so inherently asynchronous, inherently parallelized device. Like I've been saying a few times already, asynchronous state machines are something that inherently cannot be implemented on a low-cost single-core MCU just due to the fact that they are synchronous devices by nature. Forge FPGA, along with low-density FPGA as a whole, being inherently asynchronous devices, make asynchronous state machines a possibility. Fantastic. So do you have any real-life applications you can share? Yeah, very much so. One of the key examples, or an example that speaks to many of the benefits of Forge FPGA, is what we have here, the sensor aggregation use case for something like a drone. So in this use case, you have a whole host of external sensors that are responsible for keeping this thing in the air, keeping it from banging into stuff, keeping it from crashing or flying off into the distance where you lose signal. And so all of these things must be handled currently by the central MCU. And once you have enough sensors, a sufficient amount of sensors on these devices, and you know, the count of sensors on drones and, and other similar devices is ever increasing, the amount of data that needs to be handled by the central MCU can become pretty overwhelming. And unless you've designed ahead of time for an MCU that has very dedicated data pipelining functionalities, not many have. <laughs> if you've designed for that initially, then you may be all right, but most MCUs don't have those functionalities, and the ones that do are very high cost, very high power consumption. And so what you see is to avoid something like a total redesign, you may need to stick a bunch of intermediary MCUs, each handling a few pieces of data or a few sensors at a time, packaging all of that up and sending it to the primary MCU. This is... I like to say of all of the solutions, this certainly is one of them. Um, it's not a very good one, but it is a solution that we've seen in the field. And we think it is kind of an imperfect understanding of, of how to solve the problem fundamentally. And the way to solve that problem fundamentally is with something like a low-density FPGA. It can take all of that data asynchronously, so it will never be overwhelmed by the amount of data coming in and the frequency at which each piece of data is coming in. It can take all of that data asynchronously and only when it's received all of the requisite data, it can then package it all down nicely into kind of a pipeline to data packet and then send it out to the primary MCU in a much more digestible format. And so Forge FPGA can handle those parallel bit streams and asynchronous data much more easily than something like an MCU while remaining very small, very power efficient while doing so. And key to these first two options here, you know, primary MCU, it's very high spec or a multi MCU solution. It's much more affordable than those solutions as well. 
Fantastic. Now, over the years, I have heard a lot about barriers to entry when it comes to FPGA technology. But Forge FPGA is breaking these barriers, right? <laughs> yes, it, it very much is. When we were first designing or defining Forge FPGA, I should say, we spent a lot of time talking with customers and distributors and just general hobbyists who are familiar with FPGA to get their feedback on the key pain points that prevent FPGA use, especially the low density, more widely in a market. And so what we've gathered over those years of research is four main pain points that prevent customers from getting into low density FPGA full stop. We've also spoken with customers who used FPGA in the past, but have stopped or have thought about using FPGA, but have decided against it for one reason or another. And these are the four primary pain points that we've landed on as being barriers to entry at the highest level for FPGA. Number one, of course, is cost. Existing low density FPGAs, in terms of a price to performance calculation, the price to performance is not there. To, to be as frank as I can, the existing FPGA offerings on the market are pretty cost prohibitive for things at both ends of the volume spectrum, so to speak, right? So targeted applications in which, you know, maybe a relatively low volume application where bill of material cost is paramount because the return via volume won't quite be there. Existing low density FPGAs really haven't made sense from a price perspective in those applications. And then on the very opposite end of the spectrum, you have the high volume applications, the very largest volume customers that benefit greatly from the uh, kind of economy of scale and the large scale of sale and distribution that they are achieving. But at that point, pennies matter almost even more because it gets multiplied out over so many millions of devices. And what you end up with is that same price to performance issue coming into play at the high end as at the low end. So existing low density FPGAs haven't made sense historically for either of those sectors. And Forge FPGA very much is breaking that barrier in a big way. It's extremely competitive on price in low volume targeted applications. And for high volume applications, it is far and away the leader in terms of pricing points. So the second barrier to entry is kind of an echo of the first, it's power consumption. And you run into the same types of problems as you do with cost, where the power consumption per digital performance that you receive from a low-density FPGA historically has not been great. The you know, quiescent or sleep current consumption of low-density FPGAs has been relatively high, and that prevents it from being used in things like wearables or being used in things that are battery-operated or which you know, require a low power draw. And oftentimes, what you'll see is as you get further and further on the spec sheet for low density FPGA offerings that exist currently, once you start to get down into power consumption levels and price levels that make more sense for you, you're sacrificing an arm and a leg in terms of features. So things like precise power sequencing would be required, which would then require a whole nother IC, and that would mitigate a lot of the cost or power savings that would have otherwise come with the device. And so we're breaking that barrier as well by offering by far the lowest sleep current consumption of low density FPGAs on the market currently. And we're very proud of that as well. Programming, I think, is a very often overlooked pain point for a lot of customers. Going into a given solution or going into a given design, this is something I think that is often overlooked. And that is the fact that, you know, as the total cost associated with a digital logic device like an FPGA or CPLD decreases. So as your sale price goes down, the cost associated with actually programming that device with the design that you want goes up as a percentage of the total cost very significantly, very quickly. And Renesis, the business group that's responsible for Forge FPGA, has historically had a lot of success with a product line known as GreenPack. And in that product line, we offer factory programming and custom part numbering and custom data sheet creation for customers at no additional cost. And that is something that we're bringing to Forge FPGA as well. And so it's a problem for customers that's alleviated before they even know they need to solve the problem. So we're very proud of, of that business model as well. And then the final pain point to wrap up is kind of a subset of cost, and that is development. I don't know when the last time you guys got the chance to take a look at how much a seat costs for a kind of a, a mainstream FPGA development software these days, but it is <laughs> not cheap. And so what we wanted to do was offer a development software for Forge FPGA that was as close to open source as we could possibly get it, as close to no licensing restrictions as we could possibly get, 
And we did such a good job with that that we actually were able to build the software right into our existing Go Configure software hub for no cost. So no licensing restrictions. I think all you need on the website is maybe your email address to download it and you're, you're off to the races with a very nice full-featured FPGA development software for Forge. Fantastic. Now, can we take a closer look at a Forge FPGA solution? Yes, very much so. So what you're looking at here is the SLG 47910. This is our 1K lookup table FPGA. It is available now. It is in production. So after watching this video, by all means, feel free to <laughs> request some samples. It has 1,125-bit lookup table equivalents, 1,120 D flip-flops, 5K bits of distributed memory, and 32K bits of block RAM. Somewhat non-standard for FPGA offerings, this device is one-time programmable or OTP. There are many ways to program or configure these devices without actually touching that OTP. I like to call it one and a half time programmable. There are many boot options as well on top of the internal OTP that allow for tremendous flexibility so customers won't be hindered by having one-time programmable memory on board. But will benefit greatly from the one-time programmable memories, savings in cost and power consumption that come along with it. In terms of power supply structure, VDDIO is 1.71 to 3.465 volts. VDD core is 1.1 volt plus or minus 10%. And it's got a very nice power gating structure with data retention functionality, like I said earlier, that allows us to boast the lowest sleep current on the market. In the lowest current consumption sleep mode, in which the block RAM data is not retained, we actually draw 14 microamps of current, which is really tremendous. We're very proud of that figure. And even with the block RAM data being retained, so the next power state above that, we draw 21 microamps of sleep current, which is still very, very low and highly competitive with even the lowest sleep current low density FPGA offerings on the market today. So very happy with the uh, kind of power and feature specs that we were able to hit with Forge FPGA. It's got a high frequency 50 megahertz oscillator on board and a PLL that can take its input either from that oscillator or from an external source. So what you see is a very well integrated, well sorted feature set for a base offering of a low density FPGA. We're very happy with how everything shook out in terms of the performance and the feature set. And we're able to offer it, another thing we're extremely proud of is we're able to offer this very well-sorted FPGA for less than 50 cents in high volume, which is a price point that is really tremendous. You know, oftentimes when we talk to customers, this is what gets their, uh, their eyebrows raised and their ears perked up is hearing that it is that affordable for such a well-featured FPGA. And high volume in this case is about a million plus units. But like I said previously uh, on some of the prior slides, we are cost competitive to a very high degree throughout all volume ranges. That's great. Now, tell me about the LUT structure of Forge FPGA. Yeah, absolutely. So on the prior slide, I mentioned that there are 1,125-bit lookup table equivalents on board. That is because the lookup table structure for Forge FPGA is actually not a 5-bit lookup table. <laughs> 5 bits refers to a lookup table structure with four inputs and one output, so a 5-bit lookup table. The Forge FPGA's lookup table structure is what you can see here on the right. It is six input, two output. So I guess technically you could say 8-bit. I like to say six input, two output. It's just a little bit more specific. But what that means is that as the complexity of a given FPGA design increases, the number of physical lookup table stages that a given signal will have to pass through is actually fewer than on a similar design using four input, one output lookup tables. So in theory, at sufficient complexity, what you end up with is any given signal has fewer gate stages to pass through. You have lower propagation delay lower potential for errors, lower overall current consumption, and an increased design packing efficiency. Six input, two output lookup tables are not new by, by any means in the world of FPGA. They've been around for quite some time at the middle and high end of FPGA. This is just the first time it's ever been brought to, uh, or certainly that we're aware of, the first time it's ever been brought to the low density space. All right, so Matt, if my audience wants to get started using Forge FPGA, what kind of supporting assets do you guys offer? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I would recommend is going to our website for Forge FPGA. It's a Renesis website for Forge FPGA and downloading the Go Configure software hub. 
This is the FPGA development environment. You can see a few pictures of it here. It offers two different design modes, one that supports a very traditional boilerplate Verilog development flow and one that is actually based on schematic capture. So even if you have no Verilog coding experience, you can still get a basic FPGA design up and running in just a matter of a few minutes. So I would highly recommend checking out the Go Configure Software Hub. Like I said earlier, free to download, no licensing restrictions whatsoever, and you can get started with a design for Forge FPGA in a matter of moments. It also includes, in addition to all of the base features that you would expect from a full-featured development environment for FPGA, it includes an IP block library with plenty of useful IP blocks that are completely free to use as well. So if you need something like a UART interface, so to speak, or you know you need a block that can handle PWM, rather than needing to code that yourself, you can just drag and drop it into our software as well using the included IP. Comes with the download, free to use, no licensing restrictions on that either. So we make it as easy and accessible as possible for customers of all sizes and all stripes to get into Forge FPGA as a solution for them. Fantastic. Well, Matt, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very, very much. It was great getting to talk to you guys. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Renaissance. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash 